Three more people have tested positive for COVID-19 after the Gridiron Club dinner in Washington more than a week ago. Administration officials, reporters, and members of Congress are now among the 72 people to test positive for COVID. New York City Mayor Eric Adams has also tested positive. His office says he woke up yesterday with a raspy voice. He's not showing any other symptoms. He canceled all public events for the remainder of the week. Adams will take antiviral medication and work remotely while isolating. Joining us now, White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator, Dr. Ashish Shah. Very good to see you in this capacity, doctor. Um, so tell us about this. We got 72 cases. That probably means there are more. What do we know about this COVID variant? And are we seeing as many overall deaths from this latest round wherever we're seeing it? Yeah, good morning, Mika. Thanks for having me back. Um, what we know about this variant, BA2, is it is incredibly contagious, even more contagious than the original subvariant of Omicron. Uh, and it, you know, caused uh, a substantial spike in cases in Europe. It's seeing it's causing a little bump in cases here in the United States. We're still at extremely low levels. Uh, but the good news uh, is that the thing that we care most about, people getting really sick, hospitalizations, mm -hmm. deaths, they remain low. We have fewer people in the hospital right now than at any point in the pandemic. Uh, that's mm -hmm. good news. We're going to obviously want to watch that very closely. Uh, but this variant, if you're vaccinated and boosted, you still have a very high degree of protection against this subvariant. Katty K. So, Dr. Jar, it's, it's Katty here. In terms of what the public messaging then should be to people, it's confusing, right? Because I'm hearing all around me anecdotally more people getting COVID, so I've got my mask spat out again. But actually, if people aren't going to hospital, should we now just be treating this as a common cold and not worrying about it? Well, there are a couple of things. I mean, first of all, there's still a lot of Americans who are not yet vaccinated or boosted. Uh, and so when they get it, it, the consequences are still quite substantial. So we want to continue working on trying to get them vaccinated and protected. That's sort of number one. Uh, number two is I think we can we should could not let this infection run wild. We should uh, do absolutely continue to keep it, you know, watch it carefully and, and keep it under control. At the same time, we don't have to let it dictate our lives anymore. If you're vaccinated, boosted, you're going to be Highly protected. We have a lot of therapy now that's widely available for people who are at all higher risk. So even if you have a breakthrough infection, uh, you can get treatments. Uh, that means that the virus should not control our lives anymore. And at this point, uh, we should continue focusing on protecting those who are not yet protected. My Doctor, I think by now, most Americans realize that the virus is going to do what the virus wants to do. So how do you control the virus? and convince the public that we're in, almost in the clear in terms of dealing with the virus when you have huge numbers of people in this country who are unvaccinated, who don't believe in the credibility of the vaccine, who refuse to wear a mask because it's become so politicized. How do you deal with that human dilemma? Yeah, it's a really good question. This has been one of the challenges in this pandemic. You know, one of the things that has, I think, caught a lot of us in public health off guard, we really assumed, I assumed a couple of years ago, if you got these incredible life-saving vaccines, uh, we had public health measures that people would follow them in the middle of a pandemic. That has been true for many, many Americans, but not, unfortunately, everyone. I think we have to continue sharing the message, get trusted messengers, doctors, other public health people that people trust, religious leaders, uh, to share the truth with the American people and help Americans get protected. Uh, that, is, that is not something we can at all give up on. We've got to continue plugging away at that. Hey, Dr. Ja, John Flamir, good to see you again. Hoping you can provide just a little advice for people watching at home as to how they should go about the, their days right now. With We are seeing cases tick up, certainly New York and D.C., quite a, a bit. Should large indoor gatherings like the gridiron, how can one of those be safely attended? Should they be attended at all? Mm -hmm. And also, if someone is sick, there's anecdotally, it seems like the rapid tests at home are a little slow to pick up this variant, that people might present symptoms for a couple days before registering a positive. Positive. If you got the sniffles right now, should you assume you have it at least until you can get a PCR and clear it? 
Yeah, a bunch of good questions there, Jonathan. So let's take each of them. Uh, first of all, rapid tests at home do work, but you're absolutely right that there are, there are data that the first day of symptoms, a lot of people turn back negative, turn out negative. So if you've been exposed and now you are symptom, you have symptoms, um, you should continue testing. And I think in the first day or two, reasonable to assume that you may very well have it. And that means don't go out into crowds, don't go out and spend time with a whole lot of other people uh, until you've got that negative test. But that rapid antigen test does work. It just takes a day or so uh, to, to make available. Second is, you know, the treatment, Paxlovid is a treatment that works very, very well. It was in short supply a couple of months ago, less so now. So we need to make mm. that more widely available for people and, and make it easy for people to get those treatments. Uh, we have plenty right now. We're going to need money from Congress to make sure we continue to be able to get enough for the American people. Uh, but I think that's making progress. And in terms of how to behave, you know, I turn to the CDC guidance on this. Uh, CDC came out with a new framework a couple of months ago. I was enormously surprised supportive of it well before I came into this current role. Uh, it looks at what's happening in hospitals, it looks at infection numbers, and makes recommendations. That's what I personally follow, and that's what I would recommend that people follow. All right, White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator, Dr. Ashish Shah, thank you very much. Great to see you. We appreciate it. You're leaving, it makes it more likely that the Republicans are taking over. That must be hard. It is hard, but I've been vocal about what I think we should do to win in 22, allow members to represent the districts that they have. I don't want to hand this country over to a party that has become more of a cult of personality and is focused on dismantling democracy. I also don't want to hand my party over to the faction that is trying to dismantle capitalism. Democratic Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy of Florida speaking on a new episode of Showtime's The Circus with Jen Palmieri uh, about the issues plaguing her party ahead of November's midterm elections and why she has decided not to seek re-election. She's concerned the far left of the party is opening them up to being branded socialists. There's also the issue of crime. Some cities controlled by Democrats have DAs who won't prosecute certain offenses. There's also an assault on free speech from the left that's hurting the party. And the party is chasing after uh, the GOP's own the lib legislation rather than focusing on their own story of accomplishments. It's still about the economy. New polling shows rising prices is most important for voters across the political spectrum. And right now, Democrats are the ones who control Washington, D.C. Here to discuss this all, former mayor of New York City, Bill de Blasio, joins us, the host of MSNBC's Politics Nation, president of the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton, creator, executive producer, and co-host of The Circus on Showtime. Mark McKinnon is back with us. It's so good to see you. Literally, it's been years. It, literally it has years. been. It's pre still got the hat, looking good. And Lauren Leader's with us. She's the co-founder and CEO of All In Together, a nonpartisan in women's civic and political organization. Lauren, you have some polls, the top issues for the midterm elections. For Democrats, what are they? What did you find? Crisis, crisis, the economy, the economy, the economy. I mean, it trumps every other issue, mm -hmm. and it trumps it not just for Democrats, for Republicans, for voters of color, really right across the board, and it's not even close. Um, by double digits, it's the most important issue. Um, and and, and you break it down between men and women. How well is the economy working for you? This is well, interesting. Women, particularly, the economy is not working well for them. 58% of women say that the economy is personally not working well for them, that they are worried about the impact of prices on their ability to support their families, to pay for basic necessities. And what's really interesting about these polls is that voters are pretty evenly split about who they blame. Uh, Republicans and Democrats, do you, build, do you blame equally Joe Biden and the Democrats? Mm -hmm. and and Donald Trump but it, it begs the question you know how are we going to address how are democrats going to address this going into this incredibly tight midterm um, the tendency is to blame the party in so power. why i bring up women in this big number of not happy reverend al is because who ends up who ends up say, you know saving the democrats who ends up saving Absolutely. the country if you believe trump was a threat but women, right? <laughs> Absolutely right. Uh, any data shows that in the voting. So in Virginia, one in, Virginia. In, yep. in, in, Virginia, in Georgia, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is very concerning. And I, I, I did not see the poll until uh, she came out with it, but I get it every day on my talk radio show and National Action Network uh, chapters. We just had our convention, thousands there. 
they are totally demoralized around the country. You have to turn people on to turn people out. And wow. they're not turned on. And I think that, that the, the, the left and the right are misreading the people. Mm -hmm. People on the left underestimate how people are reacting to crime, public safety, mm -hmm. and people that are moderate in the party are underestimating criminal justice reform where people feel of the pinch of people that they feel are incarcerated unfairly or police that are out of bounds. And they're not talking to what people want to hear. Right, it's like right, answering right. the phone when it's not ringing. Uh, they call you crazy. Uh, Barack Obama, Mark McKinnon said, tell this, just tell the story. And there is a story to tell, but even Joe Biden at this moment, uh, that some would argue of great leadership on the international world stage, not resonating in the polls. Well, it's tough when you've got inflation and everything. You have these great uh, jobs reports. And, and the problem is that, you know, most people have a job that want mm -hmm. a job. And so uh, that's part of the story the Democrats need to tell is that you have to say the reason we have inflation is we fought COVID. The surge is down. Jobs are up. And that's the reason that we've got the prices are up. And that's just one of the consequences of, of, the, the, of the good news. Yeah. So more, uh, former New York City, City Mayor Bill de Blasio has been watching this. And I wonder what you think Democrats should do move, moving forward. And I'll, I'll I'll suggest a worry that I have. Mm -hmm. I think they're getting tweaked by Republican legislation across the country that shouldn't be, they, they, they're getting distracted, yes. completely distracted. And one of the huge problems, Mika, and I, I feel empathy for the president here because there's so many distractions. Yeah. And what you really need is message, the core message that breaks through. And I'll, I'll take us back to 2018, right. where Democrats did very well because the message was, we're going to get you health care. Across the board, we're going to help people get the health care right. they need and make it affordable. We have an opportunity to do that again now. Just passed the, you know, the House just passed the insulin bill. Uh, there's an opportunity for a deal with Manchin on prescription drug prices. There's a chance for President Biden to be the guy that says, I'm going to make your life easier. I'm going to lower those prices mm -hmm. on the thing that families care about the most in many ways, which is health care. Joe Biden is a good messenger. He is. He, you can relate to him across the ideological spectrum. He actually has the ability to reach everyday working people. But what we're not hearing is a message. If I asked you around the table, what's yeah. the Democratic message right now, half a year out from an election? I don't know what that message is. I think if we get to that clear, strong message, there's an opportunity to turn I things around. I feel if I spoke to five different Democrats, they would give me five different messages, and that's a problem. Here's another clip from the circus. Take a look. What's your outlook for the midterms, and what do Democrats have to do to overcome all the challenges? When you look at a place like Georgia, a place like Florida, where there's very likely going to be a person of color at the top of the ticket, they have to reach Obama level support amongst black voters. And so when we start to see that approval rating drop to 73, 72% amongst black voters, I could tell you right now, any Democrat running statewide in 2022 that has 73% of the black vote has lost. Really? Full stop. There is no path to victory. Wow. I think that we have to put Donald Trump back on the ballot. When you talk to voters, this idea that if we don't vote, it could lend to a, a shift in, in partisan power in Congress, not motivating to them at all. But we later asked, well, what if I told you that if Republicans win the House, then Donald Trump will be president in 2024? Every single hand went up. Oh, really? Interesting. Every single hand. Now that right there, we can't let that happen. Interesting. But more than that, for some of these voters, it's not going to be enough to give them someone to vote against. we got to give them something to vote for. Democrats have to not go out on the stump over the next six months and make promises about what they will do with the next two years. They have to demonstrate progress on what they have done with the last two years. So Mark McKinnon's conversation with the top polling strategist, I mean, there's no path to victory. Uh, those are pretty, pretty clear words. And putting Donald Trump back on the ballot, uh, didn't, that didn't work in Virginia. I feel, I'm, feel concerned about that advice. Well, it's very specific about this, though. I mean, first of all, in Virginia, you have to say you had a flawed Democratic candidate. Uh, okay. and, and secondly, what he's saying is it's not just Trumpism. He's saying you've got to explicitly say this is the gateway to Donald Trump being president again. Right, Rev? I, I think mean, you're right. And, yeah. that, and that's... And I, and, and, and I think that would... But take all of what he said. You've got to put Trump back out there that this is his gateway to being president again. But you also 
also have to say, and we have done these things and will do these things. When you talk to black voters, yeah. we did not get the John Lewis bill passed. We did not get the George Floyd uh, justice bill passed. But what did we do? Well, Biden put more blacks on the uh, federal courts than all presidents combined. Nobody knows that. You've got to put your message out there and what we've done, why it makes a difference, what it means to you at home, not the Washington Beltway crowd. And the threat of that is that Trump will take us all the way back. It must be both and it can't be either. I, I want to bring Joe back into the conversation because, Joe, as I said before, I feel like if I ask five different top Dems mm -hmm. what the message is, I'll get five different stories. What should the Democratic message be? Well, it's not all things to all people. And especially this year, I think Democrats may do better than expected in the Senate races because of how badly Trump's candidates are. Uh, but, you yeah. know, if Bill de Blasio is running uh, in parts of New York City, that's going to look a lot different than in Virginia. And, Rev, I want to talk to you about a real blind spot that a lot of Democrats in the Beltway in D.C. have that you don't and you've been warning about. But let's just say it right here and let me say it slowly for my Democratic friends in Washington, D.C. Black voters are more conservative than you are. White woke leaders in Washington, D.C. Hispanic voters are more mm -hmm. conservative than you are. White woke leaders in Washington, D.C. Asian American voters are more conservative than you are, white woke voters in Washington, D.C., and they're more conservative on crime, they're more conservative on education, they're more, more conservative on, quote, these woke issues. Get off of Twitter. I'm, I'm telling you, and, and Rev. If you look at Biden, Biden runs against 15 progressives. Biden's the only moderate. Biden wins. We've said it time and again. Mm -hmm. Eric Adams runs as a conservative. He wins Brooklyn. He wins the Bronx. He wins uh, Staten Island. Uh, surprise. He wins Queens as a conservative, uh, as a centrist Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, th can, can you please... I know you've done it a lot. No. Can you explain I mean, I, I, to white woke leaders, can you explain to them that they're not only losing white dudes in the upper Midwest, they're losing people of color? They're losing people of color because they really don't get the people of color's life. If you are living in a city, in a neighborhood that is inundated with crime, and you act like that is not an issue, you've already lost me. That is an issue. Yes, we must deal with policing. I've been out front of that. But you cannot ignore when 12-year-old kids who somebody's niece and neighbor is killed, and you act like that's a non-issue because you're too elitist to live on the ground. We don't want to be manipulated by right-wing elitist billionaires or by left-wing guys that don't understand our life on the ground that is living in fear of crime, that is yeah. living as a result of inflation that is, that is killing us. Many parts of this country, we need gas to go to work. These beltway elitists, that, these limousine liberals here in New York, don't live in the real world, and blacks have to and browns have to deal with the real world every day, and every we don't sit in crowded life. subways reading left-wing or right-wing propaganda. Right, but Incumbent French, pre French President Emmanuel Macron will face far-right challenger Marine Le Pen in a runoff after both advanced in the country's first round of voting this weekend. This is Le Pen's third attempt at the presidency. She ran against Macron five years ago when he won in a landslide to become the youngest serving president in French history. Yesterday's voting showed a much tighter race with Macron securing 27 percent of votes to Le Pen's 24 percent. Far left contender Jean-Luc Mélenchon was on track to come in third at 22 percent. Let's bring in Roger Cohen. Richard Haas mentioned that you have a great piece out. He covers international affairs and diplomacy for the New York Times and his new reporting is entitled Macron to face Le Pen for president as French gravitate toward extremes. Joe, jump in. 
All right, hey, Roger, thank you so much for being on. We, uh, we love following you and, and love your work. Uh, so you're obviously the person we wanted to talk to this morning. What I haven't been able to figure out, I, I, from your piece, I figured out that McCrawlin gets the 15% most likely from the communists, the Greens, and the socialists. But in, in the United States, we really didn't hear much of anything about this Melanchon character who got 22%. Where do his votes go? Mm. Well, his votes come from the left, and they come from all the people who no longer identify with the socialists. A lot of massive support from the young. Uh, people under 25 voted overwhelmingly, actually, for Mélenchon. The big question now is where do all those votes go? Because there's a part of the left that is very disillusioned with Macron, who moved to the right during his presidency. Now, will they hold their noses and vote Macron again? Well, one certainly hopes so, but there are some who may drift toward Le Pen. Mm. It, 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 it does seem uh, to be a bit like what we saw in the last election, where you had many people on the left, progressives who were offended by parts of Joe Biden's, uh, parts of Joe Biden's uh, history uh, in domestic politics, but there was no way they wanted Trump, is, is this uh, what we should probably expect to happen with that 20 per, 22 percent, along with the Greens and the Socialists and the Communists, that, that most likely uh, Macron gets his 50 uh, plus 1 percent? Well, Joe, yeah, most likely. But between that and the reality, there are two weeks, and they're going to be two very tense weeks. Most polls are showing right now a 52 percent Macron, 48 Le Pen. That's really within the margin of error. And as you said, the far right and the far left do meet. Most of Marine Le Pen's support is from working class France. So it's uh, not a done deal by any means. Macron did a little better in the end than some of the polls were showing in the first round. He had a very lackluster, distracted campaign. He seemed to be on the phone to Vladimir Putin every other day. And in the <laughs> end, his seeming remoteness uh, got to the French. You know, they like attention to be paid to them, especially when the election comes around every five years. So can, can you explain uh, to Americans uh, the importance, the significance of, of, of the center right and the center left completely collapsing in France, as you explained this morning uh, in your Times piece? Uh, explain, explain the significance of that and also why it happened. Where, where did the center right and center left go? Why, why did voters flee? Well, it's hugely significant. It's not, it wouldn't be, I think, too much to say, you know, roughly equivalent to the Democratic Party and the Republicans just kind of vanishing overnight. Five years ago, the socialist, the socialist president, Francois Hollande, was in power. Now we have the socialists at 2%, and we have the center right Republicans at under 5%, and that was the party of uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, who was president mm -hmm. until 2012. So this is a huge uh, sea change. Now, why? Uh, I think these parties just had really nothing more to say to the French at a time when issues like uh, security, immigration, uh, growing inequality, and technology had created, as we see in other Western societies, a lot of unease, disaffection, uncertainty about your future, a feeling of being alienated. And that kind of anger did not, does no longer find expression in these centrist parties, especially when you have a guy like Macron, who's been very agile and very adept in trying to occupy the whole center from the center right to the center left. He, mm -hmm. he said during the campaign to move forward, you have to walk and to have to walk and to walk, you need a right leg and a left leg. It was a clever phrase. It's a kind of clever, clever phrase that tends to ignore, uh, annoy a lot of his opponents. But anyway, he's been very adept at that. So all that created this implosion. So Jonathan Lemire, what's the White House perspective? They must be watching this. 
watching with great concern that if Le Pen were to win, mm -hmm. that would, first of all, just change Europe as we know it. And the European Union could collapse. It would be Frexit, as what people have said right. after Brexit. Uh, it certainly could change the dynamics of NATO and certainly this coalition they've built to stand up against Russia. Le Pen has been a Putin sympathizer in the past, and she has been supportive of Putin up until the eve of this war. And they are deeply concerned what that could mean. And Richard, aides also, senior Biden aides also said to me that they're afraid that even if Macron wins, but does so narrowly, the mm -hmm. message that could send to the rest of Europe and some of the other leaders who might be facing their own populist challenges, what could that mean for them, particularly when it comes to whether they stick with the West against Moscow? No, and that's one of Vladimir Putin's hopes, that over time, opening fissures will begin to emerge in, in the West. I want to come back to Roger on one question, which is, to me, the most interesting statistic in, in his piece in today's New York Times is last time, the last French presidential election, Macron won overwhelmingly. In the final round, roughly two-thirds to one-third. And now we're talking about him maybe winning with just a, you know, by a couple of percent. This, to me, shows a powerful, almost transformation of the of French political life, and that also ought to worry the White House. It this, does. to me, is a really powerful anti-establishment vote, immigration, class issues, and so forth. Could you just say a little bit about it? That, to me, was the most interesting statistic mm -hmm. in your piece, Roger. That, yes, Richard, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, there had been a barrier against the extreme right, against Le Pen. As you know, France had a terrible experience of extreme right uh, governance during World War II. And this, the defense of the republic, demanded that the extreme right be kept out of power. Now, this has faded over the past five years, this sentiment. It's partly that a liberal politics have become somehow more standard, more acceptable, more part of the mainstream. And we had Donald Trump in the United States. Uh, Marine Le Pen was very quick to congratulate Viktor Orban in Hungary, leader of the liberal league, if you like, in Europe, on his fourth consecutive victory. Uh, recently, she there was a makeover of Le Pen, a sort of milk toast makeover. She smiled a lot. She talked about her personal issues. She, <laughs> she, uh, she was different in appearance, but you know she wants to fine, make it illegal to wear a headscarf in public, that that kind of thing. So uh, her basic politics have not changed, but it's become somehow more acceptable, and that's why we're seeing a, a likely margin that is so much smaller in the second round than it was five years ago. Roger Cohen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. And we have not made a decision about referrals uh, on the committee. I think that it is absolutely the case. It's absolutely clear that um, what President Trump uh, was doing, uh, what, what a number of people around him were doing, that they knew it was unlawful, they did it anyway. There's not really a dispute on the committee. Um, the committee is, is uh, working uh, in a really collaborative way to discuss these issues, uh, as we are with all of the issues we're addressing, um, and, and we'll continue to work together to do so. It's 10 minutes before the top of the hour. Republican Liz Cheney, the vice chair of the Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol, says the committee has enough evidence for a criminal referral of the former president should the committee decide to proceed with that course of action. Meanwhile, the New York Times reports former President Donald Trump's eldest son sent the White House chief of staff a text message two days after the 2020 presidential election that laid out strategies for declaring his father the winner, regardless of the electoral outcome. People familiar with the exchange said on Friday. The text was sent by Donald Trump Jr. two days before Joe Biden was declared the winner of the election. It's very simple, Trump Jr. wrote to Meadows on November 5th, 2020. He wrote at another point, we have multiple paths. We control them all. NBC News has not reviewed the messages in question. This is according to The Times. The message went on to lay out a variety of options that Mr. Trump or his allies ultimately employed in trying to overturn the results of the election, from legal <clears throat> challenges to promoting alternative slates of electors to focusing efforts on the statutory date of January 6th for certification of the Electoral College results. The Times reported a lawyer for Trump Jr. confirmed to the Times that the text message was sent, but suggested it was someone else's idea. 
<laughs> that Donald Trump Jr. was passing along. It's always someone else, Joe. It's never ever well, uh, a Trump. <laughs> well, well, either way, it's damning. If it's from right. the son, it's so, damning. But yeah. if he's passing it along from a staff member, it seems to me, Richard Haas, that's even more damning that you have White House staff. We know they're doing this, but you have White House staff that's saying we own the legislatures in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in Georgia, in Arizona, in all of these states. So it doesn't matter whether we have the most votes or not. We can figure out a way to rig the system to win. And what's most remarkable about this and what shows their intent from the very beginning is these text messages were being sent around while the votes were still being counted. They knew they were going to lose. They knew they were going to act illegally. They knew they were going to try to subvert the Constitution. They knew they were going to try to get the legislatures to ignore the will of the people and not allow a peaceful transfer of power. This is extraordinarily damning. I, I know people get tired of hearing this stuff, but this is extraordinarily damning that the mindset for Donald Trump's staff, if we're taking Junior's attorney's word for it, is we're not going to win the election, so let's rig it. Let's find a way to stay in power. This is, this is more than two months before January 6th. If you were ever looking for intent, if you were ever basically looking for people saying no matter what the results are, we're going to figure out a way to game or rig the system to essentially disenfranchise the American people and bring about the outcome we want, this, this, this is, this is you know, pretty good. And again, I'm not a lawyer, but whether it passes muster in the court of law, in the court of public opinion, this tells you what you need to know. Yeah. And let's also recall that even before these text messages were sent, Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal attorney, Mika, was talking on election night that mm -hmm. Donald Trump should come out and declare victory while yeah, votes are still being cast. Just come out there and say we won and then let the chips fall where they may. Joining us now, former U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Alabama and an MSNBC legal analyst, Joyce Vance. Joyce, your thoughts on these texts? I think Joe just gave a pretty good closing argument for a criminal jury to hear in this case. These texts provide some of the pieces that we've been talking about over time. You've heard many of the legal analysts say that one of the most difficult challenges the Justice Department would face if it wanted to bring a prosecution is proving intent, proving that Donald Trump really knew that he had lost the election and that the big lie was just that, an effort to steal the election. So mm -hmm. having this text from Trump Jr. that while the votes are still being counted, acknowledges the loss and then lays out a strategy, it's not just deeply offensive to the American people. And I worry that sometimes we get lost yeah. in all of the back and forth on this and, and don't take that moment to be offended that a sitting president thought it was legitimate to bypass the will of the American people and steal the election for his own. But this provides that key element of proof the government would need to go forward with a, a prosecution that they knew they had lost the election, that they continued to engage in efforts to, to take it from Joe Biden nonetheless. Bye. Joyce, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here. Uh, Joe just actually summed up the situation perfectly on a national basis here. People are tired of hearing about all of this. That's understandable. From your perspective as a former U.S. attorney, looking at what's happened in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office's investigation of Donald Trump, from the January 6th assemblage of evidence against Donald Trump, and from other investigations that are ongoing, as well as all of the anecdotal evidence we have, would you indict him? The question of whether to indict has to be an evidence-specific case, and there are a lot of moving pieces. I have sympathy for what DOJ prosecutors are looking at. There are issues as varied as a First Amendment defense. For instance, whether or not the speech that was used on the ellipse is, is protected by the Constitution and whether that could prevent a prosecution. That's just one of the many difficult issues prosecutors have to parse. The court of opinion, as you point out, is something entirely different. And there's a little bit of fatigue right now in the court of public opinion. But that's not how prosecutions work. If DOJ decides that the law and the evidence merits prosecution, 
Then a jury will be assembled in a courtroom in the United States District Court in the District of Columbia. That jury will hear evidence, not this entire enormous mess that's really what I think right. has uh, created fatigue in the public, but they'll hear very specific evidence on each of the elements of crimes that are charged, and they'll make a decision about whether anyone who is charged with those crimes is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Something that we've seen over and over in these cases, I remember the prosecution of Paul Manafort, mm -hmm. is that citizens serving as jurors can set aside their preconceptions and their biases and hear that evidence and reach a ruling. So that's a very different sort of enterprise from the court of public opinion. And Joyce, back to this just being offensive, perhaps even more offensive now, as we look through the lens of history, we watch Ukraine's struggle for survival with a leader that Donald Trump tried to shake down. I mean, it's the offense factor is is way up. Joyce fans, thank you so much for joining us this morning and still ahead. And in just hours, President Biden will introduce a new, an array of new measures to combat gun violence. The main target, ghost guns. The weapon can be 3D printed at home, essentially made of plastic, meaning they can bypass metal detectors. They also lack serial numbers, and many big cities say they are recovering from an increasing number of these weapons. In addition, President Biden will nominate Steve Dettelback as the director of the Bureau of alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives. He's a former U.S. attorney and a career prosecutor. The announcement comes after a weekend of violence in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Two people were killed and 10 others hospitalized after a nightclub shooting there. Police say the investigation is ongoing and no arrests have been made so far. Joining us now, White House Domestic Policy Advisor and Director of the Domestic Policy Council, Susan Rice. She also served as National Security Advisor in the Obama administration. And it is great to have you on the show this morning. Joe starts us off. So, Susan, thanks so much for being with us today. You look at these ghost guns and you look at the fact that they're custom made for terrorists. They're custom made for gang members. They're custom made for career criminals. I salute the president for making this uh, stepping in this direction. But nobody opposes this, do they? Like Republicans don't oppose this, do they? Well, I'll let them speak for themselves, Joe, but there have been historically opposition from the NRA and, and other uh, pro-gun uh, entities to any kind of restrictions on ghost guns. And as you say, these are the weapons of choice uh, for criminals, for terrorists, for domestic abusers, because they are unserialized. They have no number on which to trace them back to uh, the seller and therefore the owner. And why this action that we're taking today is so important is that it will require uh, that there be serial numbers on uh, these so-called kits, homemade kits that people can purchase online with the parts and the directions to make uh, a ghost gun at home in under 30 minutes. These are very, very dangerous weapons, and they are increasingly showing up on our streets as the weapon of choice for criminals of all varieties. So, Susan, I'm confused. Why would any gun group, why would anybody want guns to be uh, to proliferate across the United States of America where there are no serial numbers, where people can go through TSA checkpoints and take guns on planes and hijack planes? Uh, they can go into courthouses, kill judges, kill plaintiffs, kill anybody inside those courtrooms. Why, why would anybody not support the banning of this dangerous technology? Joe, for the same reason these people do not want common sense background checks for all uh, guns sold, uh, they don't want to close critical loopholes in our background check system, the same people who want assault weapons on our streets, uh, these are, you know, our pro-gun uh, lobbyists uh, with a great deal of influence, unfortunately, in our Congress and in, uh, and in this town. And they want nothing to do with any kinds of restrictions on dangerous weapons, whatever their use. Ambassador Rice, good morning. John Lemire, great to see you again. The president also expected to announce his new nominee for ATF director, Steve Dettelback, as Mika said. Uh, this comes, of course, as after the White House had to withdraw the nomination of David Chipman uh, following protests from Republicans who said he would not protect their right 
to bear arms. Can you tell us what sort of message is the president sending with his current nominee? Well, Steve Dettelback is a career prosecutor, spent more than two decades in the Justice Department as a prosecutor uh, going after uh, violent gangs, arsonists, violent criminals of all sorts. He's extremely well qualified. He was confirmed unanimously on a bipartisan basis when uh, he was uh, uh, named U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. Uh, so he's extremely well qualified, and anybody uh, in the United States Senate who is concerned about reducing crime, dealing with our gun crime uh, challenge, um, and ensuring responsible, reasonable, uh, thoughtful leadership at the ATF should be supporting Steve Dettelback. Uh, Susan, it's Kathy Kay here. I just on Ukraine and specifically about your old beat at the United Nations. You were the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. President Zelensky recently addressed the Security Council and he was absolutely scathing, saying they may as well, you know, pack up and go home if they weren't going to do, try and do something to, to keep the peace in Ukraine. Was he too harsh about the U.N.? I mean, it's been striking how absent the United Nations has been from what's happening. There are no peacekeepers. Uh, the Secretary General Guterres has not gone to Kiev recently to visit Zelensky. Should the UN be doing more? Could the UN be doing more? Kathy, tempting as it is, I, I'm not going to uh, talk to foreign policy and national security uh, in my current role as domestic policy advisor. I'll leave that to my very capable colleagues. All right. Okay. White House Domestic Policy Advisor <laughs> Susan Rice, uh, thank you very much. It's always good to see you, and we appreciate, we appreciate you coming you. on.